Those are some great talks this morning. I'm going to be kind of changing gears a little bit, I guess. Um, this is going to be a pretty uh, specific dive into how we're using API Manager um, at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Um, so let me just kind of set the context a little bit. Um, I'm a research scientist and software developer at TACC, uh, which is basically the high-performance computing center at the University of Texas at Austin. And um, it really is a, a world-class center. Um, Stampede um, is our probably our most powerful supercomputer. It's seventh on the top 500 list, but we have about a dozen or so HPC systems, everything from you know big memory nodes uh, to do big data stuff, um, you know, uh, petascale storage, um, and, and a data visualization systems. Um, and we also have about 110, 120 staff that do consulting on those systems. So um, that, that's one of the things that I do. So I, I work in the Advanced Computing Interfaces group, and we're primarily charged with trying to bring interfaces to the web to enable scientists to use these HPC systems um, without without having to actually know a lot of the stuff, the system administration type stuff um, that they've had to know in the past. So, um, uh, so before I talk about what Agave is, let me give you a little context. So historically, like I say, in order to use these systems, what scientists have had to do is pull up a terminal, SSH into a head node, and run shell scripts or you know other scripting language tools to interact with the scheduler and submit jobs. And basically, uh, you know, this is, a, this is requiring a lot of skills that they don't typically have and don't necessarily want to obtain, right? I mean, they're scientists, they want to do science, and this is just stuff that's ancillary that they have to do to, to, to get their computations running. So what we, what we want to do is, of course, mitigate that and, and allow scientists to return to doing science and, and spend less time as a system admin. So initially what that meant, about 10 to 15 years ago, what that meant was building these web portals, basically these science gateways that um, you know, scientists could go to and, and, and log in and uh, use a web interface to interact with HPC systems. Um, that was good, but it was very domain specific. Right? I mean, you would get one of these big multi-million dollar platforms that would be built um, for a very kind of specific and niche group of scientists. And um, so what we've been trying to do lately is build a platform that can empower um, you know, the, the production of these gateways for lots of different uh, science domains. Um, at a relatively small cost. So, so that's the Agave project. Um, that's a project that I've been working on for about the last year to year and a half. Um, and it's, it's a web-based you know, RESTful API to enable you to interact with HPC systems <coughs> on the back end. HPC initially, but actually uh, more and more people are doing stuff with cloud uh, systems uh, Know, private and commercial, as well as um, cloud systems hosted attack. So, you know, at the end of the day, the primary use of Agave is to run scientific codes on these on these execution systems and uh, manage data on the, the various storage systems. So, um, the the sort of core services are uh, a notion of systems. So that's a, a primary resource that we have. Uh, you can identify. Basically, anything that you have SSH access to um, as a system that Agave is going to be able to be aware of and act on on, on your behalf. Um, it could be, you know, a private VM uh, on EC2. It could be Stampede. <coughs> but uh, systems um, form one of the key notions in Agave. Uh, then we have the notion of apps. So these are literal science, you know, scientific apps typically, but, but binaries that um, you would execute on one of the systems. Um, we have a files endpoint, which um, is, as you'd expect, um, sort of the, the Agave abstraction of a file. Um, and we have a jobs endpoint, which is the, 
the way that you submit jobs to, to execute applications. So these are sort of the four core services. Uh, there are about 12 services in all. We, we have um, other things in there that, that, are, that are core, but um, that, that's essentially what Agave does. It's a RESTful, um, sort of web-enabled uh, service, set of services to enable you to interact with the HPC. Um, it's, it's eventful. So um, everything you do in Agave, sort of every step along the way, um, events are firing. And uh, you can, through our notifications service, you can register webhooks, you know, uh, email addresses, SMS, and um, get notifications and take actions on behalf of, of whatever to, to, um, to do your work. Uh, so it, we're, we're also course compliant and we have OAuth 2. And uh, by, by the way, feel free to just interject. I have some slides, but I don't have to stick to this. If you have specific questions, just, just jump right in. Uh, so it's a platform. Well, we've heard a lot about platforms at this conference, and uh, we, we agree, you know, plat platforms are, are key. Um, and so it, it's part of how we envision sort of changing the way computational science is done. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But, but so why, why is it a platform? Well, it's first and foremost, it's hosted. Um, we host all of the services um, in our private cloud, primarily. Um, we have a sort of active, passive-ish kind of uh, setup where we will um, kind of move everything to uh, a commercial cloud. We have agreements with um, Azure and uh, EC2 um, to sort of move like move the entire set of infrastructure over um, in situations where our our data center on prem is going to be out. So we we still are attacked. We do a lot of things really well, but but we're still kind of uh, getting our heads around being available all the time. And sometimes networking will just say, "Hey, we're taking maintenance this Saturday," and it's like, "Okay, so we're going to be down all Saturday." No. That, that's not acceptable. So, so we've, we've got a setup where we'll, we'll just kind of migrate all of our, our infrastructure off um, to a commercial cloud. Um, it's multi-tenant, and this is key. Um, so we, you know, we have different organizations um, that, that use our stuff. And each organization wants, you know, typically represents a different science domain. And, wants its own view, at least logical view, into the APIs. They want their own set of apps, they want their own set of job history, etc. You know, we have a notion of public apps and private apps, and, you know, a, a computational chemistry lab doesn't want to see a bunch of plant biology apps in, in their public application catalog. So, um, it, it was really important that we, that we had a multi-tenant sort of tenant-aware service. Um, and so that, that's part of the platform. Um, <laughs> We have a full featured sort of identity and access management offering that's it's also hosted. It's backed by Open and LDAP um, with OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect as the, the authorization layer. Um, API management, including analytics, um, and a, a suite of developer tools that we're kind of continuing to, to evolve. Um, we have a command line interface. Um, which is kind of ironic since we built this whole thing because we wanted people to not have to use the command line and then one of the first things we did was really the command line interface because we, we love the command line. But, um, we also have a bunch of different language SDKs, Python, uh, R, Java. And we do white label deployments. So we will brand the, the, user, the end user facing web applications like the, the authorization pages and stuff. We, we will brand those for a specific organization or tenant. Um, if they if they need, if they want that, so we are in production. Um, we have I have here four tenants really that we're that we're in production with. I I was telling somebody earlier it's kind of always hard to know exactly when we're in production. I mean nobody actually ever pays us anything. It's all you know government funded. But so maybe we have six. I don't know. It depends on how you count. But um, but the iPlant Collaborative is a plant biology project. It's our biggest one, about 20,000 um, plant biologists. And all the way down to Irisector, which is a Canadian lab that does sort of neuroscience type work. And 
that, that was one of the things that I wanted to, to talk about was that we've kind of seen this sort of, uh, well, we think we're seeing this emerging sort of bimodal distribution of the types of tenants um, that we're going to have. Um, sort of on one end, we have these large sort of multi-million dollar, multi-year ongoing NSF or NIH funded uh, massive cyber infrastructure projects like, like iPlan. And um, those are great, you know, and those pay the bills to some extent. But on the other end of the spectrum are these sort of small little, you know, university, typically university-based uh, research labs like iReceptor with, you know, maybe 15, 20 people in them. I mean, so you've got a couple of PIs maybe, a handful of postdocs, and, um, you know, a number of graduate students and, and lab techs. You know, they want their own sort of view into the APIs as well. So um, that kind of leads me to uh, the architecture. Um, and and the, the entire architecture for the services, I think, is, is, is neat, but I'll mostly focus on API manager and, and what, you know, how we're using that, because I think that's probably what's most useful and relevant to you. Um, uh, but so, Core services are mostly written in Java. We have a handful in Python and PHP as well, um, those, those 12 core services. And then um, we have API Manager, basically supplying all that platform uh, stuff that, that, I, that I showed you on the previous slide. Um, so we're in production with API Manager 1.5 um, for, you know, for, for each of the, uh, the tenants. Actually, so, so we're in production for, for the first three with 1.5 and, and iReceptor is now in with 1.7. They, they just came on, um, I mean, we just got to production with them a couple weeks ago. Um, so we're trying to migrate to 1.7 uh, now and I, let, me, let me talk a little bit about that. So currently um, each tenant has its own instance, its own deployment of API Manager. Um, we, we did that for a couple of different reasons. First of all, we needed, we thought we wanted and needed to scale each organization separately. We also wanted to be able to brand things separately, uh, you know, things like the OAuth application. And we could have probably jumped through some hoops to make it work with the multi-tenant model in 1.5, but um, but we decided this was a simpler, just sort of easier way to get there, and, and we were kind of uh, tight for time. Um, we are moving, we are hoping to use um, API, one, API Manager 1.7 in the multi-tenant model um, to serve that sort of smaller set of tenants that I, that I alluded to earlier. So th the problem with this approach is that it doesn't scale for us. It doesn't scale up to a sort of self-service, self-provisioning tenant model, which we see as, as key. Um, we, we, we can't afford to deploy, you know, a VM or two per per group. So um, and those people don't need white labeling. They don't need their own you know individual scale. Um, so so what we're looking to do architecturally in the future is um, is have our one seven sort of multi tenant deployment that will be scaled. You know a handful of VMs behind a load balancer um, to handle those small sort of self service uh, self provisioning organizations. And then we'll always, what we hope, we'll always have the, the sort of um, dedicated hardware um, for for the bigger the bigger groups. But but we really are trying to focus on these these smaller groups, the, the scientists who 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 essentially have never gotten into computationally intensive science because uh, they couldn't because they didn't want to do the system administration stuff that it took to um, you know. To, to do it, and, and because they didn't have, you know, a multi-million dollar grant to build one of these great big uh, web portals. Um, so, a couple more comments. We, we use WSO2 BAM for analytics. I really can't say, I, I really don't have that much experience with, with BAM specifically. We've, we've been pumping data in there since the beginning, but we really aren't using it other than the sort of uh, dashboards that shipped out of the box. Um, uh, so I don't I don't have too much to offer there, um, but of course we have a host of other things that we use like OpenLDAP, uh, MySQL, Mongo, um, etc. 
So um, this is a large sort of diagram of the overall architecture um, of the, the entire system. Uh, it's, it's pretty massive, at least for us, it's a pretty massive distributed system. I think we're at on the order of 50-ish VMs. So this is, like I say, primarily hosted in our, our on-premise cloud. Um, we, have, we actually have a couple of clouds. We have um, a VMware cloud and we have uh, an OpenStack instance as well. Um, but OpenStack has been, so in, we, we primarily use uh, VMware for production. Um, we're still sort of hardening our, our OpenStack instance. Um, but the, the thing that I wanted to, to basically bring up here is that this, for us, is a complicated thing to manage. And so we took some time to figure out how are we going to, you know, how, how are we going to actually manage all this infrastructure? Um, because it's not just the, the 30 or 40 VMs that make up our production environment, it's all the stuff that makes up our development environments. Um, as well, and we need to be able to spin those up and turn them down, and, and you know, not not blow through resources, but but be able to test things out, um, kind of at will. So we're using a tool called Ansible primarily for that, um, which um, is an orchestration management tool. It's a Python-based tool, um, similar to Chef or Puppet, you know, in, in some ways, if you're familiar with that, um, and. I, I won't go into a whole lot of details unless someone wants me to, but ba basically we have role, you know, we, Ansible has the concept of roles and, and playbooks, and we build out roles for every, you know, type of software deployment we could do. And that gives us the ability to spin up, you know, tenants sort of uh, at will, as well as to uh, pull up a development version of that tenant uh, whenever we need to. Um, we're also looking at a technology called Docker, uh, which is a container-based sort of, um, it, originally it was LXC-based uh, container technology. Um, we were in the process of getting to a production deployment where everything is, is Dockerized, uh, you know, or containerized. And uh, that, that's been an, an ongoing process, um, and we're not quite there yet, but um, if, if anybody is, is interested in that, I can, I can talk to you more about that. Um, I, I will mention a few things, why, why WSO2, so um, I was actually involved in a NSF funded uh, cyber security infrastructure project where the, the basic charge was to um, sort of evaluate next generation authorization solutions, specifically OAuth2 and, and to a somewhat lesser extent OpenID Connect. Um, and so we started off just evaluating OAuth 2 solutions. And I mean, literally, probably evaluated a dozen or more. Um, all open source, of course. I, I guess I should have said that, that everything that we do um, as sort of an NSF funded, primarily NSF funded uh, agency, um, anything that has got software deliverable is sort of mandated to be completely open source. So that was, that was our view from the beginning. Um, but anyway, so literally, you know, dozens of, of OAuth 2 servers, Java, PHP, uh, Python, um, Spring, you know, Spring Security, and honestly, uh, the, the API manager, just the OAuth 2 server alone was the most featureful that we found. Uh, you know, it had, and I should say, this was um, about a year and a half ago. So um, at the time, anyway, it was, it was the most beautiful. I mean, everything from, you know, all of the grant types were supported, um, you know, support for scopes, um, JSON web tokens, you know, lots of the extension specs, you know, to do all to, not just the, the primary spec. And if, you're, if you're familiar with OAuth 2 spec, you know that it's, it's very liberal in what it says you can, you know, what, what it says you have to include, and it, and it seemed like they really went it, as far as they could to get as much in as they could. Um, so anyway, we we ended up kind of making that as our recommendation, and it just kind of naturally fell into place with all the API management features as well. I, I really do think that um, 
you know, because I do, I, I, I'll say, you know, I, I constantly, well, maybe not constantly, but I'm regularly looking at what offerings are out there um, to make sure that what we have is the best. And, and I, I think for the most part, it really is the only open source offering that is, that is this feature pool. And, and of course, analytics with BAM, which I say we haven't done much with yet, but we, we hope to. Um, so a little bit about the performance. Um, so we've, we've improved it over time. Uh, it's, we're about 97% uptime on our, on our off layer, which is not where we want to be, um, but it is, a, it is something we've been afforded um, so far in the sense that uh, we're sort of startup y, you know, in, in our in a, sort of in a startup mode at this point. Um, but no, we, we want to be um, at three nines or even four nines. And we, we have some plans for that. We, we've improved uh, the stability a bit with some patches. Um, and um, we're migrating, like I said, to, to API 1.7. So this is 1.5. These are statistics on 1.5. Uh, and I, we've We've been doing some some stress testing, some load testing on on one seven, and we are we're quite confident. So far, everything looks looks good. It looks like we're going to have it's going to be much more stable for us. So, um, yeah, I think that's all I have. So, thank you very much. Did you wire any test automation? Uh, yeah, we, we did. Um, so we actually run Jenkins and as our build server, and um, it has uh, you know hooks, commit hooks to our, our Git repo, and it runs a full suite of integration tests. And then you know if things pass, it it runs Ansible playbooks basically to deploy things. Um, <laughs> so for a couple of our production servers, we still push manually out to them because uh, you know it's, it's a little more critical that they the things I mean you know so our integration coverage is good I could say it could be better you know but um, yeah what, why do you have downtime with the API manager? Um you know it, I'm not sure it, so it, it requires it, it fails so we have failures um, off failures um, and we have um, like to take a specific, specific example, we have a token endpoint that um, occasionally will return uh, 200, but an empty payload. So there's no there's no JSON actually in the, the response, and we haven't been able to figure that one out. But um, but so effectively that kind of puts the whole platform down because end users can't get a token and. Uh, so we we have monitors in place to 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 try to catch that stuff, or we at least we've added that, and um, we uh, occasionally I don't know I, I don't think it's for that one, but we there are a couple of things that we've noticed that when we see them the failure doesn't seem to recover, like it doesn't seem to self heal. So what we'll do is we'll as soon as we notice it we'll basically restart. The API manager, and if, so we don't not in all the production tenants, but so in two of them we have um, a load balancer with with two instances of API manager, and um, we can effectively we can uh, you know pull one out of rotation, <coughs> restart it, and you know pass traffic through to the other one. Um, so stuff like that. You know, that we, we we work with you so um, we are we are actually so we don't actually have official support. We we are still working that through. It's it's really a technical sort of legal issue. I mean, because we need everything to be open source, one hundred percent. That I think that's been primarily that plus plus cost. We we need to be able to redistribute the the stuff that we do. Um, it is all hosted, um, but but um, we need it to be able. Because it's you know grant funded, we need people to be able to pull it down and uh, spin it up. And if, if that's in production, that you know that needs to be in production. And so it's it's working through how to how to do that, uh, you know how how to sort of cover support for that where we don't even know how many JVMs might be running, kind of a thing. Uh, but we we have we've worked with WSO two a lot um, 
just, I think they've been very helpful to just kind of, in an ad hoc way, you know, to help us work through stuff. So this HTTP 200 uh, no JSON issue, is it a product issue or is it a specific implementation issue? I'm sorry? This uh, no JSON object with the 200 uh, HTTP code, is it a product issue that uh, you, you guys think, or have you identified is that it as a product issue or is it an implementation issue? I'm not really sure. I, I, you know, I, we haven't identified it. I, I think that it, it could easily be a resource issue, you know, on the on the VM itself, where where the where the JVM is running, you know. Um, but so so as an example, we we did um, beef up the size of the VMs running. Running, uh, running the infrastructure at one point, and uh, we saw improvements, or at least we saw uh, the, the rate of incidences decrease, but they didn't go away entirely. But is it consistently happening in all the you know, all the instances you have, or is it only happening in specific uh, deployments? No, it, it, it happens across the board. You say specifically Yeah, well, I mean, the, the entire stack, actually. Yeah, so the gateway, the off server. Um, so what we do is, so for the tenants that have a single, that they run on a single host, um, we have two JVMs running. So one for the gateway and, and the off server, and the other for the, the publisher and the store, okay. the web applications, uh, because we the, the the publisher and store we're not making as much use of, you know, and, and well, in other words, they just don't have as much of an uptime right. requirement. So we can bounce that JVM right. uh, um, sort of more easily right. <laughs> than we could do. Yes. But but so yeah so. We have a couple on, on the full stack on a single host, and we have a couple that have um, basically two hosts behind the other one. And in, in that architecture, we have uh, the publisher and storage on a separate host from, from the gateway. Do you know a data replication requirements of any kind or anything like that? You can quite build it out to that level yet? When you say data replication, which do you mean like? What do you mean? Like the, the synchronizer synchronization. Yeah, I mean, you have like yeah, we so we have tokens across geographic sites. Uh, no, we we that's that is definitely some place where we want to be. Um, but no, everything is hosted like on the website. Yeah. Thank you. Guys. Thank you.